and you know we live in a post-fascist world you know um in which uh you know these techniques have been adopted by liberal democracy they have you know the public manipulation and state repression and you know they just do it as a matter of course like you don't have to have an extreme ideology to motivate it you just do it the death of god is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a Sublation Media podcast. Chris Catrone, uh, track coat for Marxist, uh, contrarian, literally Hitler. Welcome back <laughs> to the Diet Soap podcast. And actually, I should change the banner. We'll do that right now. It's the Diet Soap Podcast. Thanks for coming back on. I'm glad to talk to you because the last time we spoke and I interviewed you, I felt as though you had a lot of things to say and I was trying to clarify things and didn't quite manage to. And I feel yeah, it's like a, this of a is, sequel to our last discussion. Yeah, absolutely. And, and this time we're going to have an opportunity to speak a bit more directly and hopefully less across purposes. Not that I disagreed so much with what you right. were saying before. Um, so what we're talking about, what the title of this is, is going to be the, the rational kernel of postmodernism, something like that. Maybe the rational kernel of post-structuralism. So where I want to start with you is, do you distinguish between postmodernism and post-structuralism? And how do you start to look for the rational kernel in postmodernism? I think that they're distinct, um, like we talked last time, uh, because Postmodernism, I mean, this is going to seem strange to you, but I would date postmodernism um, very early. What we're familiar with in terms of generic postmodernism and the word postmodernism is like post-World War II and kind of post-60s, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a kind of a cultural turn in the 70s. And that's when like, you know, starting in the 60s, but really in the 70s is when Gramsci is rediscovered, subaltern studies gets underway, the Frankfurt School is rediscovered. A lot of translation mm -hmm. of the Frankfurt School happens in the 70s. Um, even Lukács, is, you know, history and class consciousness is translated in the early 70s. And so, you know, there's that kind of postmodernism. I'm influenced in my perspective by a variety of thinkers, including Gillian Rose, who sees postmodernism going back to neo-Kantianism, the late 19th century. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and the kind of aftermath of that, the discontents of that in the early 20th century. Another way of thinking about it, especially because postmodernism is so much French fries, you know, Derrida, Deleuze, Foucault, uh, Lacan, uh, is um, Heidegger. Did you say postmodernism or poststructuralism? Postmodernism. Postmodernism. Okay. Yeah, because poststructuralism, I think, is more like a method. Do you know? It's like a kind of um, reaction against and an you know, like deconstruction is like a kind of method, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, that's post-structuralist and is, you know, sort of specific to certain things. Whereas I'm not sure if there's like a post-structuralist view of history and society, but there is a post-modernist view. I think that you're, you're quite right in a way about the methodology, although I'd also say post-structuralism has different concerns than post-modernist. Yeah, that's true too. Um, um, the, the way I think of it is postmodernism, I understand through Jameson mm -hmm. and, and, and maybe, cultural logic of late capitalism, right. Which I read in, uh, in the nineties and, um, and, and then reread and turned back to, you know, many times. And I read it before I read the Frankfurt school and I was vaguely aware, but I wasn't really aware yet. that He was such a major interlocutor for the Frankfurt school and kind of intermediary for the reception of the Frankfurt school. Because his book before that, um, about like, you know, literature, you know, is really about Lukács and the Frankfurt School. Um, in that postmodernism book, which must have come out when I was in college, 
I think it was like 89. Yeah, that's exactly when I was in college. Yeah. And, um, you know, you know, a little bit, not sure what was going on here, but I was also amenable to the general thrust of, I mean, I think that in many respects, I mean, it's a different kind of book, but David Harvey's condition of postmodernity. Mm-hmm. I, I, yeah, I, that, that didn't influence me as much until maybe later. And I've never really sat down with that. But the, the thing about Jameson is that what I recall, especially having read the essay, which was published, I think in the new left review, before yeah. the book, yeah. um, is that for Jameson, he attempts to clarify what postmodernism is by thinking of it in primarily ascetic terms and, and then, or through the arts and then particularly through architecture. So, um, which is where the term originates, right? You're right. And so he, he references the manifesto learning from Las Vegas, the turn away from high modernism towards a more populist approach to, uh, to architecture, um, combining low and high elements, um, tr- trying to take up, a the, find the, the what's good in, in mass culture. Um, and what I, you know, just sort of put a very gross kind of reading onto this, a very, uh, you know, this is not as detailed as it might be, but in general, the turn away from high modernism, I take to be as a turn away from the ambitions of high modernism and an acceptance of late capitalism or the, 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 the lowering of her, of horizon, um, high modernism was, had an utopian aims. They were trying mm-hmm. to, mm-hmm. uh, create new ways of living and, and mm-hmm. through efficiency and, and, and spare design and, and, um, you know, junk culture being embraced was a, a way of embracing what's already happened. Like mm-hmm. you know, the highways are here, the neon signs are here, um, the future's already been created. We don't have to try. Doesn't to he also have a treatment of um, literature though, like the Lillo? Yeah, he does. As, like the postmodernist novel. I mean, because what I'm thinking yeah. about here is, um, and this would be like a point of contact with Harvey, is that modernism would have been understood. And, you know, I would have a lot of challenges to this view, by the way, the use of this language. Mm-hmm. Modernism would be seen as the cultural aspect of a form of capitalism in the kind of early 20th century. Mm-hmm. And then postmodernism is, is a, a change with capitalism in its kind of cultural forms. Um, and, you know, it is an abandonment of a kind of utopianism, but the modernism of the early 20th century would have been a kind of capitalist utopianism. Yeah. Oh, yes. Right. 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 And so. Yeah. You know, and then, of course, one could say that neoliberalism is a kind of an abandonment of utopianism. You know, postmodernism is an abandonment of utopianism in that respect. Or you could say it's, a, it's just a different form of capitalist utopianism. Right. That, I think those both, that's fair. Um, what Jameson says is that the early mo- you know, modern, high modern moment was uh, obsessed with uh, differences in time. Mm-hmm. Whereas the postmodern is, is thinks of things in terms of space. So, Mm -hmm. um, that, and that, that seems like, you know, at first blush, like, yeah, you need time for space and you need space for time. What is he talking about? But, but the, he was talking specifically about the cultural differences that arise from a, a capitalism, which is defined by uneven development where you can move, um, because you can move from a, 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 like the urban centers where everything is hurried and you can see the frenetic pace of capitalist production and exchange taking place and you're, it makes demands upon you and, and forces you to live on a certain timeline. And then you can move away from that back to the countryside into a slower pace, different form of life. I mean, perhaps, right? Because uh, I guess the way, yeah. I'm just, I'm just paraphrasing. James well, I mean, right. it's in terms of like an aesthetic form or a style. You know, because that's the, you know, from architecture, we get postmodernism as a style, and then that bleeds into other kind of art forms. We get the notion that there's a modernist style and a postmodernist style. But the time and space thing, yeah, I'm, I'm somewhat familiar with this, that, um, that there's more of a homogenization of space in postmodernism, mm-hmm. right? I mean, well, well there's, a, there's no longer a sense of historical time in postmodernism. So all that you're focused on is space and, and everything that appears 
appears in the same moment. Therefore, it's, it's just a matter of relating in space rather than through time. Right. So there's kind of globalization, anti-globalization, you know, mm -hmm. um, and so it seems to have a different kind of dynamic than the dynamic left and right, mm -hmm. which, you know, was the earlier dynamic of like progressive versus progressivism versus reactionary, mm -hmm. you know, kind of trying to go back. And, you know, I would just, so I would, this is not the rational kernel of postmodernism exactly that I had in mind. Right. No, I'm just, uh, just trying to find right. how I think of postmodernism as associated with late capitalism and uh, a, a cultural form that takes place once the commodity form is dominating almost all aspects of, inter of life internationally. That's how. Right. Now, this is kind of a retrospective, um, funny thing, though. And again, the point of contact between postmodernism per se and the Frankfurt School, because one thing that we have to remember, mm -hmm. I'm a Frankfurt School person, so that's going to be my kind of like yeah. locus here. Now, in the 70s and 80s, I think that the French fries, the postmodernists, were received in very similar terms to the Frankfurt School and and, you know, especially in the Anglophone world and in Britain and the United States, I think that they were harmonized kind of ironically, given the fact that there would have been a great deal of hostility towards, um, postmodernism in its roots by the Frankfurt school. You know, like I said, Heidegger, Heidegger has a huge effect. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you about this, mm -hmm. and it does, ref it does actually relate to time and space, but in a kind of mediated way, mm -hmm. um, is reification in other words that the you could say that the critique of reification might privilege time over space in the sense that you know we want to push through these kind of ossified forms you know mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that kind of idea and you know it's really unfortunate i think because um, you know it's kind of like the way people assimilate lenin and sorel you know it's it's this kind of actionism and you know nowadays accelerationism which is poorly understood and i have students come up to me and say well it sounds like marxism is accelerationist and i'm like okay that's not really accelerationist but yeah i kind of understand tell, what you mean. tell me remind me i've known the name sorel i i'm the ideas don't just drop into my mind when you say he's an anarcho-syndicalist mm -hmm. right and so he privileges like action right so there's like a kind of you know, we've talked about this before, like um, voluntarism versus determinism. Mm -hmm. You know, like the social change going to happen because of objective logic, or is it going to happen as a matter of, of will, right? Mm -hmm. And um, you know, and those two things don't necessarily contradict each other, but their experience is contradictory, mm -hmm. right? In other words, that in the face of a kind of reified world, then one wants to break out, and one does of will and the sort of ethic of action which actually you know really has more in common with fascism than marxism and mm -hmm. and then with lenin but you know what happens in the 20th century you get this weird anti-totalitarianism and then it's like well you know fascism and stalinism and lenin you know kind of the same <laughs> um and you know benito mussolini who was a marxist but then invents fascism right because he's got tired of the second international with their kind of evolutionary view of history. And he's like, no, we need to act. Mm -hmm. Right. And Marxism is too kind of objectivistic. Right. This kind of thing. And I think that this is all like really deeply unfortunate, but it is what happened historically, you know, especially in the crisis of Marxism, Marxism seemed to disintegrate into like objectivistic and subjectivistic sides. Like the social Democrats were seen as objectivistic and Leninists were seen as subjectivistic, but then also Stalinism had the kind of objectivism too. Right. Right. Okay. So let, let, I mean, I, I'm following along, but I want to make sure that everyone who's watching who doesn't know as much as you do and, or, or even as much as I do can follow along. So just to be, so what we were talking about before was how from the in the late 20th century and like say 70s 80s on the postmodern moment arose through architecture jameson saw this as a uh for closing um the possibility of historical change due to the domination of of capitalism late capitalism and the the 
the to totalizing hegemonic uh, uh, power of the of capital and a global kind of so coming to an eternal present. Yeah, and we come into this eternal present, which which resonates with me as someone who's read Gita Board, who wrote about that in the '60s, and the, the and who is also very concerned about with. And Jameson's up, aware of that too. Oh, I know he is very yeah. much. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and is concerned with taking up history, mm -hmm. um, and and freedom being a way the way in which individuals and society can be responsible for and conscious of their develop their own development uh, in history, making you know shaping their path forward. Basically, that's what being free means. Um, for right. So a kind of historical fatalism versus a historical voluntarism is right. replaced by a kind of ahistoricism or a historical eternal present, which is projected backwards. Right. And what you just raised before was, okay, but this can also be thought of in terms of are we embracing the dynamic that has been shaping history up to now, which is this capitalist form? Or are we trying to break from it somehow, smash that form right. in, a, in, a, in an act? Um, and uh, so now, and then the question becomes, so are we, if you're, if you're trying to uh, somehow embrace that dynamic in order to transform it, then you're an accelerationist, right? It's and just funny, a, you know, I teach Benjamin, Walter Benjamin, and he's misread as like, um, you know, he's got a line in the Paralipomena to the thesis on the philosophy history or the concept of history that's a better translation of the title that uh, Marx said that revolutions are the locomotive of history but maybe uh, revolutions are the attempt to pull the emergency brake on the locomotive of history mm -hmm. right and I always have to you know warn my students you know it's not an either or for Benjamin it's both in other right. words like revolution is the locomotive of history but it's also the attempt to Pull the emergency break on the locomotive of history and uh, use other Benjamin's writings to illustrate that because uh, he, you know, he's very fond of the surrealists, although critical of them as well. And they, they're like fascinated with this kind of fixed explosive, you know, the simultaneous like, you know, bursting and freezing kind of, mm. you know, effect. And so, you know, all of this, you know, obviously people outside of Marxism you know, Marxism regards uh, the historical moment. People are trying to grasp, you know, their their experience of society mm -hmm. um, in various different ways. And the idea is that spontaneously people do express the contradiction of capitalism through attempts to, you know, capture, objectify their experience in art, in culture. and But also one could say that, you know, concrete labor forms concrete ways that we work. And this is where Harvey is good in the condition of postmodernity. The mm -hmm. changing character of the actual concrete activity of labor itself changes. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, because what we're trying to do when we're working, even at that fine-grained, atomized particular level, is sort of master our experience of space and time that society is confronting us with. Right. And now the, the problem being, you know, the way this is usually understood, and that's why I said that's not really like a methodology exactly in the traditional sense, is that it's not like capitalism is a form of space or is a form of time. It's a contradiction of space and a contradiction of time. So there is like bourgeois time and bourgeois space, you know. There I is. think of capitalism as a social relation mm -hmm. around production primarily. Mm -hmm. That then has the consequence of, and, and not in any fixed or static way, mm -hmm. but of shaping the way in which we understand our relationship to the world. Um, and, and often enough, we understand our relationship to the world as a relationship to alien objects outside of ourselves and mm -hmm. not as something we're participating in through our social relations and production. The well, wait, but, but we do. Or in other words, there's bourgeois society and then there's capitalism. And this is something that, this is my, one of my only, if I had to say, what's the one thing that I want everyone to know? Mm -hmm. There's a difference. There's indeed a contradiction between bourgeois society and capitalism. Meaning capitalism is the self-contradiction of bourgeois social relations. Meaning, you know, people on the left will say, well, capital is not a thing. It's a social relation. Well, actually, 
for Marx, it's a contradiction of the bourgeois social relation. That's the whole bourgeois social relation versus industrial forces of production. People forget that's a contradiction. And that means a contradiction between the socioeconomic base and the ideological superstructure. It also means there's a contradiction between social being and consciousness. But doesn't it also mean that at the site of production, mm -hmm. there's a contradiction between the, um, let's say, constant capital or the machinery or the, mm -hmm. uh, and the human mm -hmm. beings who are working together to, to make that. That's a manifestation. Uh, That's right. Yeah. So you have um, the space and time of machines and the space and time of humans, mm -hmm. right? The problem there being that we might, we might end up falsely naturalizing the space and time of humans. You know, we don't know, like, you know, what the limits of the human capacity for relating to the universe in space and time are, but we can say that there is a disjunction in all the attempts that we have, you know, and deeply in our psychology, the way we experience space and time. There's a disjunction between that and a kind of social dynamic unleashed by capitalism. And again, that's so concretely it can manifest as like a kind of modern times by Charlie Chaplin, you know, mm -hmm. contradiction of the human and the machine, but the human is far more variable than, than we might give credit to if we think of it just in those terms, if we think there well, is this kind of ape. And then if you're, if you're really going to make a film about the contradiction between social relations and, and the, the forces of production, as I'm understanding it, what you'd have is a film where Charlie Chaplin is fired or let go. <laughs> so um, is replaced by a machine and then this the company goes out of business uh -huh. that, that that's that, that's, that's a real manifestation of contradiction yeah, right that is um, because you know we do we do try to mechanize ourselves i mean you know doug i don't know if you had this in your um, educational experience i certainly did mm -hmm. the the 60s they vilified taylorism oh yeah Right, they really attack Taylorism, and I'm like, Taylor is a labor reformer who's trying to change the work process so that there are fewer injuries and deaths of workers on the assembly line. But they turn it into, oh, look, he's photographing. He's trying to turn people into machines. I'm like, actually, he wants to change the machines so that they're more amenable to humans. And he's looking at, like, you know, how humans move, right? And he's looking at how machines move, and he's trying to, like, you know, it's not like, oh, look, this is subjecting human beings to this mechanical imperative of capitalism. It's like, that wasn't the intent. I mean, maybe that was the effect. Yeah, in modern times, there's a critique of Taylorism. They, there is, they, there's a they reading, drag in the... There's huh? a reading of it. Yeah, yes. The, mm -hmm. the feeding machine, the guy, the scientist comes in and says, uh -huh. he can keep working through lunch. Look, this will feed him his corn. And it comes up and, like, Woody Allen stole this later and did this uh -huh. all the time. Uh -huh. It was like... You know, like, I mean, it's a funny, you know, but again, what's the goal of that efficiency? Well, you know, to make capital more efficient also means making humans more efficient. And that means actually feeding and clothing and housing and not injuring humans, mm -hmm. right? Like, it's not terribly efficient to mutilate humans. No. Right. So like, you know, but again, I, I just, you know, I just want to be careful because lurking in the background is Heidegger. Okay, well, let's talk about the bourgeois. Before we go to Heidegger, mm -hmm. let's talk about the bourgeois, um, you know, society. Leonardo da Vinci, Leonardo da Vinci mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Is he trying to mechanize the human? Exactly. No. no. Right. But this is the way the mid-20th century saw it. The Vitruvian man, it's like, look, oh, you know? Like, mm -hmm. it goes back to the beginning of bourgeois society. And Foucault's got a lot of this. I mean, he's kind of ambiguous about this. I mean, you know, so you and Ashley were talking about Foucault and she mm -hmm. was like, you know, he's right about a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, is he a Marxist or not? And well, he's not a Marxist, but he is in dialogue with Marx. And as Ashley observed, he really has a lot in common with Weber, and also obviously with Heidegger because Heidegger is influencing Foucault. And, you know, these technologies of this and that, like this Foucaultian jargon that we have in the world, you know, technologies, gender, technologies, uh, race, mm -hmm. technologies. That's all Heideggerian, Foucauldian stuff because everything's a technology, mm -hmm. right? And, and, you know, Heidegger's willing to trace it all the way back to ancient Greece and say, you know, that's when this dynamic was unleashed. 
And it's kind of like, you know, sure. And again, you know where I got my Heidegger when I was in college? Mm -hmm. I read on my own Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Oh, right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And that's where I got my Heidegger, I think, for the first uh -huh. time. Um, but it's uh, a bit of Heidegger running around. Yes. Yeah. And Include the board, by the way. Oh, uh, no, I don't want to hear that. But it is okay. there. Okay. And so this is the well, thing. Let's talk about how it's there because I want to. Just briefly sketch my understanding of Heidegger. Yeah, I have not deeply read. I, uh, you know, I've read the last thing, and maybe the only thing I really read by Heidegger that's really written by Heidegger. I read an Adbusters magazine uh, hmm. a few years ago. I went to a, 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 a thrift shop and bought an old oh, yeah. copy of Adbusters magazine from the late nineties, and they had a, a lecture. Doug, yeah, <laughs> maybe in New York too. Yeah, maybe in Chicago. I, I don't know, though. I think all those bookstores are out of business. Oh, it's great. I mean, I love Portland for that reason, you know, and maybe right. I shouldn't, but I love it. No, 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 it's OK. <laughs> and I went in, I bought Adbusters magazine and I was not surprised, but I was I kind of went, oh, hmm, because there it was this uh, address that he gave on uh, tech uh, technology and technological thinking. Yeah, and trying to develop a space for thinking that was not technical right. of the technological right. moment, and um, I read it and thought it was really pretty deeply romantic and right. reactionary stuff, yeah. um, and that it didn't hold up as uh, as a as an argument. You know, it didn't hold up philosophically. It 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 was it might have held up in terms of sentiment or rhetorical uh -huh. style, but it didn't hold up very well. And I think of Heidegger in terms of trying to solve old philosophical problems, like how do we know the world? What, what you know, um, you know, and and he he will claim, well, we're thrown into a world that already provides us with a form of knowledge that we can only then use reason to access when things start to fall apart. So you don't think about how the door knob works until you can't turn it. Um, mm -hmm. Until then, it's just a a, a part of this being in the world mm -hmm. it's not mm -hmm. it's not something that reason gives you access to mm -hmm. and um and that's how i conceive of heidegger is wanting to find a way to not have to be engaged in the world critically or using reason as a guide but to find a way to fit into a world that's already there to support you and the, the already well it is this critique that the world is kind of constituted in such a way that we like are unaware or you know forgetful or neglect that you know um you know and again he he wants to understand where that kind of blindness came from and he's you know critiquing you know that kind of um blindness it seems to me to like want to embrace that as a kind of ground uh, ontological ground that 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 the way in which we are thrown into a world that already uh, that's making demands on us already has systems of mastery already has and already uh, has a place for us in it so that and that that form of thinking that a kind of episteme is <laughs> superior to and to be embraced as opposed to the technical thinking of of mathematical reason and and that that will dissect the world and and uh, that Ooh. will really comes prior Mm -hmm. to to crisis right. or problems rather than uh come uh go, come sorry really comes after crisis and problems and mm -hmm. which doesn't then what's the pr prior to that what's foundational of that is a, a way of being in the world now this is my popularized understanding of Heiger from reading adbusters magazine so you correct me if i've gotten them wrong well i mean it's um i mean what i'd say about heidegger is i mean because this came up with you and ashley mm -hmm. You know, because uh, you were talking about dialectic of enlightenment, you were talking about Horkheimer and Adorno, and you were talking about the first chapter of dialectic of enlightenment, the concept of enlightenment. Interestingly, mm -hmm. you know, um, originally the book was meant to be titled Philosophical Fragments, and that mm -hmm. first chapter was supposed to be called the dialectic of enlightenment. Mm -hmm. But then the publisher was like, philosophical fragments, that's not going to work. And so suggested taking the title of the first chapter and making it the title of the book, mm -hmm. in which case, the first chapter then became the concept of enlightenment, which has a much more kind of positive kind of notion, you know, like that he, they're like telling you what enlightenment is rather than engaging in a dialectic of enlightenment, which is of mm. course what they're doing. Now, you know, so 
when we talk about like a Heidegger or Foucault or Weber, even Nietzsche, mm -hmm. Weber is a Nietzschean, Heidegger is a Nietzschean, Foucault is a Nietzschean. Mm -hmm. And, um, and of course this is, uh, either a virtue or a damning thing against the Frankfurt school that they're Nietzschean too. Right. And, but it's controversial in the Frankfurt school. I don't but, think that's even how we should think about these things. No, no, I know it's, but this is how people do, right? In other words, mm -hmm. this is like a Gabriel Rockdale type, you know, intellectual history as like forensic for like yeah. culpability or something. I love Columbo, you know, I want to solve the crime too, but first you have to make sure that you're actually dealing with the murder before you. you also, what, what's the crime? What's the yeah, crime? Right. right. Is there a crime? Did the Frankfurt School commit a crime? Does, is Zizek committing a crime? And what would that crime be? And crime against what? Crime against whom? The dispute, if you will, between like the Frankfurt School and Heidegger is that Heidegger is grasping something, but he's mystifying it. Right? That he is, it's not like he's wrong. Like what he's saying is right, mm -hmm. but he's mystifying the problem. And, and one of the ways that we would, to invoke, Jameson, always historicize, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Right. So how do you demystify things? Well, you historically specify them. You say it's not 4,000 years of Western metaphysics. It's a hundred years of capitalism. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it's not, you know, since 1619, but it's since the 1970s. Mm -hmm. You know, that the, the, that the blacks are suffering in the United States from deindustrialization, not from the endless legacy of slavery, mm -hmm. right? because they were making great advances in the 20th century up through the sixties, but then they suffered mm -hmm. disproportionately from the effect of the And that, and to, to say that is very counter to the mainstream narrative, yeah, mainstream narrative. only the sixties that when black people started to finally achieve some equality. And now today, of course. Right. They, they're there almost. I mean, Barack Obama happened. And, well, that's, you know, if you look at it in terms of the ruling class, I mean, it's like a funny, and of course, you know, what I just said is Adolf Reed. Right. 100% Adolf Reed, mm -hmm. that um, the process of deindustrialization really mystified capitalism. And one of the mystifications of capitalism is to call it racism. Right. And that, you know, maybe you could make an argument about an earlier form of capitalism in the United States that was very much based on racism. But really what you're talking about now, racism is not illuminating something, but it's actually obscuring something. And right. when you say racism is obscuring it, you mean not only that the racist ideas themselves are obscuring Let's see. Anti racism is obscuring. Yeah, anti racism. Anti racism is obscuring. It's like a funny thing. I was listening to um a podcast this morning, uh, there's like a libertarian Comcast a podcast exhibit that was comparing me to like Caleb Maupin. It was like Chris Catrone, you know, and what about these, what are uh, these Marxists? And, you know, and then, um, Sean Gabb, who I guess is a British libertarian. Mm -hmm. And it was something like, you know, what are libertarians and Marxists have in common? Oh, well, let's look at Chris Catrone because they were like, you know, most, most so-called Marxists and leftists are just Democrats, but this mm -hmm. Chris Catrone over here clearly isn't mm -hmm. right. Mm -hmm. And they were, they were kind of struggling with it. And, but I realized that the, um, you know, the issue is they said, okay, they were kind of saying, oh, Chris Catrone is like, um, He's like Caleb Muppin. He says, you know, of course we need to care about racism and sexism, but look at the way the Democrats ruin it, right? And I thought mm -hmm. that was interesting rather than just saying, oh, well, there's trying to some like a dinosaur Marxist who doesn't care about these things. And I was thinking as I was listening to this, I was like, yeah, of course I'm against anti racism as this kind of ridiculous ideology, but, but only as someone who's against racism. Heidegger is also undialectical, right? Um, he would see the dialectic, you know, as this thing that started with, it's very Nietzschean, started with Socrates mm -hmm. and then developed. And of course the dialectic is, is the problem. Like in other words, the dialectic might describe what's going on, but this is the metaphysical trap that we're in, right? It would turn it into this kind of like way of thinking that goes back thousands of years in the West, like this Western way of thinking, mm -hmm. you know, 
Um, I mean, I wanted to say about this that there is a Lucian Goldman thesis that Heidegger is responding to Lukács. Hmm. Um, and you know, there's there's a fair amount of evidence for that. I mean, certainly Heidegger's responding to Marxism, definitely. Mm -hmm. You know, and so again, what's his beef with Marxism? Well, he thinks that Marxism is onto something. But Marxism shares the same assumptions as Western philosophy and is therefore as blind as Western philosophy is. Mm -hmm. Right. That, say more about that. What are those, what are those assumptions? Well, for instance, um, he, you know, labor metaphysics, you know, the relation to nature. Any, any kind of metaphysics, right? Not just the labor metaphysics, but any well, kind Western of Western metaphysics. metaphysics. Western right. Metaphysics. Um, so Western metaphysics in particular, going back to ancient Greece, that basically Marxism is too bourgeois. It's too bourgeois insofar as bourgeois society really does have an origin in classical antiquity, which it kind of does. I mean, I, you know, I always like to point out that Heidegger did his PhD on Don Scotus, mm -hmm. right? And he, you know, you could say that the university of being, you know, the Don Scotus medieval scholasticism, that that is really what Heidegger is saying throughout his career, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, the, the way I think of Heidegger's critique of Marx is this, is that I remember seeing him interviewed and he said, uh, Marx uh, said the point of the, the in the past, philosophers have tried to describe the world and know it. The point is to change it. And uh, Heidegger answered, said, but of course, he's, he, he appears to be changing the aim of philosophy, but he is not because in order to to uh, change the world, you have to know it. He, as a as a technician, as someone who's going to intervene in right. instruments of reason, you right. have to know it. Right. Um, right. But what what I thought is that well, um, what Marx is claiming is not that oh we should stop trying to know the world. And then in a sense, not. Heidegger, Heidegger is oh. quite right in 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 yeah. saying oh well he is Western or ra rational and uh -huh, yeah. you know, right. Um, but that, he, it's, uh, uh, that Marx poses as anti-philosophical, but of course he is still philosophical. Well, yeah, but right. So, but yes, yeah, sure. so he, he wants to realize philosophy, not just, not destroy it. Right. Um, uh, but so, but you know, Heidegger is sneaky. He's sneaky about that kind of thing. Meaning he's kind of like, that's like a cheap shot. And he's sneaky also because he certainly knows better. Meaning it's the thesis on fire. And it's really about how the left Hegelians found themselves in a position where they could only rail against the world and, you know, show how, you know, why it is the way it is, but really couldn't say anything about how we're going to change it. Right. You know, and I, and for me, the critique from Marx, the left Hegelians is in the German ideology. Right. What, what right. And, and which so, is where the theses of on Feuerbach are taken. Right, right, right. And, and in the German ideology, what he rails against with the with um, the Hegelians, young Hegelians, yeah. young Hegelians mm -hmm. is that they are attempting to change things at the level of thought yes. and understanding and yep. knowledge alone, right. as if everything resides in our heads only. Whereas um, Marx, I think, as a, an actual Hegelian, uh, understood that the connection between the material world and uh, our understanding coming out of our mode of production, out of the way in which we alter the world, and the way in which we collectively organize and alter the world and reproduce ourselves. And Heidegger has nothing to say on that level. Well, he says that the very conception that we are products of and enacting and reproducing a mode of production mm -hmm. itself assumes too much, right? So he he could sort of takes. You know, you could say that Heidegger, like I said, he's sneaky because, you know, he's writing mostly in the era of Stalinism. Mm -hmm. And so there is this kind of vulgar Marxism out there that he can kind of rail against. And then he can, mm -hmm. like, w as he sees fit, he can kind of bring Marx in to say, oh, but Marx also understood and these Marxists. But Marx, right? And I even had, there was a philosophy professor at the University of Chicago who said that Heidegger was a Marxist. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, oh, he believes that there's such a thing as a labor metaphysics. Right? And I was like, huh. yeah, right? And I thought it was going to be that, like, asserting that 
that there's a labor metaphysics and like, you know, rather than observing that there is a labor metaphysics, right? I guess if you have a critique of a labor metaphysics, because you think that it's a thing that should be overcome, you know, that there is this thing, then I guess Marx and Heidegger agree, right? They just disagree on the nature of the problem there. And also how, of course, how to overcome it. Right. Whereas this, you know, philosopher was essentially an analytic philosopher, right? Was like, well, there is no such thing as a labor metaphysics, right? Like there is, it doesn't exist. Right? Um, and so to posit that it does exist is itself a kind of mystification, right? And it's kind of like, well, no, it really does. I mean, you know, the analytic philosophers are not great on society, they really aren't. Um, meaning society is a metaphysical category. Does society exist? Or are there just these things that humans do, right? Are there social relations? Do social relations exist, right? Um, or are there just these con conventions that we have, right? Okay. What is it about analytic philosophy that distinguishes it from continental philosophy? Why, isn't, why are these things different? I think the way in which the analytic philosophers turn to uh, uh, and attempted to understand the world simply through um, l either language or mathematics or or some sort of uh, logical structure that we could then find um, in, in our own cognition, whether it was mm -hmm. whether it was um, in a Kantian way or through like mm -hmm. uh, Chomsky and linguistics, mm -hmm. it was always sort of like in in, in inscribed in individuals and. The reality was a product of the structure of our brains or the structure right. of the language itself. Right. Um, and, and it was something that, again, to go back to kind of Heidegger, we were already in. Yes. So this was a way of being in the world. That's right. Um, whether there. it was linguistic right. or, um, uh, or if it was, uh, you know, a, a Kantian categories or. That's or, the connection with structuralism and post-structuralism, by the way, is that kind of linguistic like, determinism. Right. You know, that's the point of contact, which is, you know, again, independent of Heidegger, but then they harmonize in the thought of the 20th century. In other words, there's a kind of a spontaneous affinity that people start to see it this way, mm -hmm. that we are somehow produced by language as opposed to language being a tool that we use and then we become alienated from it. And then it seems to dominate us. But the question then would be, well, you know, it's like technology itself. It's like, you know, or have we just let the genie out of the bottle and now it dominates us? Or, you know, is it like a quasi natural object, you know? Um, or is it a tool that we have to master, right? That's a, that we've created, that we continue to create and recreate, and that it has escaped our control in a very specific way rather than in this kind of general way of, oh, whenever you create a tool, it masters you. It, you don't just master it, right? Like when you, when humans create a tool, they change the being of the world and it redounds back on them. And it's like, well, that might be true in some very general way, but, the, but behind it, in other words, why Heidegger would conceive of things this way, Marxists would say, well, that's a phenomenon of capitalism. In other words, you know, cause I don't think the ancient Greeks or medieval Europeans or certainly bourgeois thinkers would have seen it just that way, right? Would have seen it, it would have struck them as very strange, the idea that we are products of language or that we are the products of technology, right? It would be like, well, no, you know, we make these things and it, they have their effect, right? There would be a much more kind of confident, optimistic view, which Heidegger says that, well, that's blindness. That's like a kind of a hubris that's like, you know, we think we're using it, but it's actually using us. And of course, that's capital, right? Except of course, capital is us. Capital well, is right. right? And we are, we are ultimately responsible for, for this form of social relations being reproduced every day. It's very difficult to get away, to get away from it. We aren't just provided each day with like tools to create some, to set up a new social relationship. All the tools that we've created, all the ways of thinking that we've created are aiming us back to this form of production. So to change away from it will 
take some time and collective effort and politics. I mean, again, Heidegger's unclear about why that's the case specifically, meaning, you know, why it's so difficult to change it. And so, you know, he said it took us thousands of years to get into this predicament and thousands of years to get out of it. Whereas, you know, Marxism obviously has a more optimistic view yeah. of the ability yeah. to overcome capitalism. Yeah. Right. We're not yeah. going to be exploring space and still like contemplating Heideggerian thoughts a thousand what, years. What that doesn't notice is how different the rate of change has been yeah. over that thousand years. It's not like right. bit by bit over a thousand years, day by day, we accrued all these changes and here we are. It's like, we went along fairly consistently and then we changed and then we changed even faster and changed even faster. Um, yeah. So what is the rational core here in Heidegger and Nietzsche? What do, what, what do we need to hold on to with them? Well, I mean, differently, you know, I'd say that, um, I would say Nietzsche is a liberal, you know, in distress and Heidegger is more of a, just a reactionary. In other words, there's a great deal of Heidegger that Nietzsche would reject rightly. Um, and even the whole notion of like the will to power is very different in Nietzsche than the idea of power in Foucault, for example. Oh yeah. Right? So, you know, the question is, well, what changed between powers the main... and, and let me think about right. it. Like, in Foucault, power is alienated from us. It's not the will, something you will towards as in an act of creativity in order to change and create new myths and new ways of being power is something that has been externalized and, and is maybe the op major operating force in the world, according to Foucault. We participate in it. He does have this funny way of thinking about it in terms of biopolitics. I mean, he's just, Foucault's weird because I think that he is a conservative, but then he seems to be an anarchist. And it's kind of like, well, how I contradictory know, is that really? Very <laughs> contradictory. It's, it I was reading a, Ad Busters magazine when I come came up on the Heidegger. Heidegger, thing. and yeah. presumably that's an endorsement. Like they didn't publish Heidegger. Oh, no. Right. right. No. No, no, no. no. Right? It was a um, full-on endorsement of Heidegger. Right. Huh. So it's like, you know, I would say that, you know, what the rational core is, mm. is again, that postmodernism is registering a problem and especially a problem as it manifests after the failure of socialism. Now, again, we're always in this place of like, why did socialism fail? Why did Marxism fail? It must be, you know, again, the Foucault answer or the Heidegger answer would be Marxism didn't go deep enough, right? It didn't grasp the problem in its depth. And so it couldn't solve the problem because it only grasped the problem superficially. And in fact, well, in, a post right? Stone says that about traditional Marxism. Check it out. Postone's a Heideggerian. No, no, no. Yes. Okay, explain to me how Yes. Well, I mean, look, Moise said in his interview for Platypus, I'll refer mm -hmm. to the Platypus Review interview done by some of my students. Mm -hmm. He said that, uh, you know, he found the reactionary critique of capitalism far more compelling than the left, right? Nietzsche, Heidegger, like he found that far more compelling. And then he discovered that traditional Marxism is superficial, but Marx himself is deep. And then he's like, well, but of course, Marx's politics is traditional Marxism. So Marx couldn't follow through on his own insights, but that shouldn't concern us because the insights are important. Yes. So he divorces the theory from the practice. He really I'm sorry, I guess I'm a reactionary now because that sounds true to me. This is why... You know, in my pet what guide, did he find? What did he find when he said he found these reactionary, or would you say romantic, mm -hmm. uh, critiques? Of yeah, he he capital. used the language to the romantic critique is deep, right? Because it's like raising all these questions that traditional Marxists like ignore, and it's like that's not true, really, you know, and. And, you know, it's based on this whole idea of like Engelsism and Marxism, you know, I mean, Marx will say these things. It's a very naive view of the history of Marxism. He's like, oh, you know, Marxism is really Engelsism. By the way, these libertarians that I was listening to this morning, they were like, well, you know, the Communist Manifesto wasn't written by Marx, it was written by Engels. And I'm like, that is not really true. Because right. Engels wrote a rough draft that we have, and the final manifesto is quite different from the draft. Right. Um, so, but, you know, but there is this idea that like 
there's like Engelsism and there's Marxism, true Marxism. And traditional Marxism is Engelsism. And, you know, like Marx, oh, is this kind of dark genius, you know, kind of like Heidegger. Here's all I would want to point out in response to what you just said about my, uh, I'm a fanboy, my, my God, you know, who I've never met really, except I've interviewed him a couple of times, Pustone, who I think is really brilliant. And, and, uh, yeah, well, brilliant. Just said, of course. But what I want to what I want to do to defend him is say yes, it's true that Poston and he may have said this about reactionary critiques or romantic mm -hmm. critiques, but it, what Poston means, I think, when he says we need to go deeper, is precisely that we need to be Western philosophers. We need to be uh as fully reasonable as we can be and as critically sure. as we can be sure, sure, and sure. heidegger is rejecting that heidegger is rejecting heidegger is not technical... exactly no he's not exactly rejecting it outright what he's saying is we have to be cautious right so he has this kind of like you know this idea of care and circumspection right so he's like you know that you know basically he does ultimately want to stand in the Western tradition. But he wants to be circumspect about it rather than simply inhabiting it. Um, All I would say regarding Pistone again, to go back to that, is just if, if it is a case historically, let's say somewhere within the Second International or in, in the, if not then, then in the you know Soviet Union, um, there was a... a a misunderstanding and simplification of Marx's categories uh, that was put forward. There was more than that, Doug. There was a kind of totalitarian bureaucratic agenda to actively distort Marxism for political reasons. Right. Well, absolutely. Right. But I mean, right. but let's say let's, but I, I mean, I think, I think you could, yeah. like, I think Rosa Luxemburg is a great Marxist who is still nonetheless worth reading critically around, let's say, points of economics or some of the, ways in which she would, you know, some of the claims that she would make are absolutist to Marxism. I'm not so sure she's right. Like that you have to think that, um, what was she, that, that, uh, that the, the class, um, project and the development of the working class necessarily leads to the, the workers into a proletarian, uh, struggle, pro proletarian struggle that otherwise you don't have a working class if it's not engaged in a, and oh, sure. well, that's Marx. That's Marx. Marx thinks well, he does. But so does he think that, that you can't reproduce, that capital can't reproduce itself through labor time without a political struggle from the working class? Well, once the, once the, the dynamic is set in motion, then I guess it can continue. But it was set in motion by the class struggle. Oh, the oh well, yeah, sure. Right. It was part of a socialist and bourgeois revolution that could create right. these conditions. But that doesn't the mean early, the early struggles of the working class in light of industrialization is what, what, I mean, you could also say that the workers asserting their bourgeois rights is the very source of industrialization. You know, it's, it's creates this dynamic. Yeah, I know Spencer talks about this quite a lot and it, he points to it in the, in capital and it's absolutely there and I know about it. And, you know, it's a major point in the uh, history. It's of, a little of bit of an absurd point for us. You know, because again, we think, the well, 40 hour work day. I mean, like if you didn't have the limit, ten hour for, work, yes, but it's a 40 hour work week, 10 hour work day, a 40 hour work day. Would Actually a 60 fun. hour work week. It was 10 hours a day, six days a week. And that was considered a major reform. Right. Okay. Right. We get, but, but now off. we get, well, right. now we get 40, uh, if right. we're lucky, not really. I mean, but that's why the people were massacred at Haymarket square. They're asking right, for exactly. work a, week and the capitalists are like, what is this utopianism? Open fire, right. but but in <laughs> fact, but, but in fact, um, <laughs> if without it, the there, w the capitalist class would not have been pressured to innovate technologically and and, and industrialize. It's a very complicated process, right? Because right. it's also contingent. You know, Pistone yeah. talks about this. It's contingent as well as logical, because um, you know, a lot of the early class struggle of the working class like in England in the in the first industrial revolution is motivated by like how unchristian it is to work people this way mm -hmm. you know, you have to give them Sunday off you know otherwise it's unchristian and it's kind of like well what's that 
you know? What, is that just like a, a handy thing or did the kind of Protestant Christianity play a role? It might have played a role. In other words, well, I think it did. Absolutely. But on the but on the other side of it, I do think that without labor struggle demanding a 60 hour work week, there would have been pressures, just intrinsic, necessary pressures within the capitalist. There are, there are. That would have driven innovation, but maybe not as quickly or quite. They're also deflected now. Like in other words, now, you know, um, in the post-proletarian world that Postone thought we lived in, because he did. He thought we lived in a post-proletarian world. I never understood how he could say that, uh, but by his own logic. I never understood how he could say that because oh, he because... admitted that the that yeah automation is happening yes but you know that the, the the working class could shrink for a time. I mean, he was a little bit incoherent, Doug. I have to say, and that's what one of the things made him uncomfortable about me is that I wouldn't leave it alone. Pressured him on this, that I basically said, well, because he would have a critique of the left as prematurely prematurely post proletarian, but then he would also say. Well, you, we have post-proletarian movements, and those really have to be, you know, how we achieve socialism. But he would, it would be, he would do this thing where he'd say, "Well, proletarian socialism is necessary but not sufficient." And I thought, well, why not? And because again, for him, if it's proletarian socialism, then it will just be capital reconstituting, and so it has to be broader than just proletarian socialism. From my perspective: What you have to do is say. The proletarian pol- political movement has to not aim at reproducing the proletariat. Right. When it takes dic- when you create a dictatorship of the but proletariat. But you can also, you know, Lenin, the Tribune of the People. In other words, that the proletariat, the class conscious proletariat, like constituted in a socialist party, has to champion all the oppressed. Right. Okay. I mean, That's sure. True. Right. It has to lead a kind of more a broader democratic discontent in society than it can't be like narrow workerist or yeah, but how could i mean if, if you're workerist then you're not transforming and transcending the class position i mean if you're workerist then you're obviously creating policies that are protecting your own particular interests you might as well just be well rather than being workerist why not just be pro uh you know ford ford workers well I mean, okay so you know how it works how this kind of plays out mm-hmm. is that you know, it's like the PMC anxiety that people have, right? The yeah. professional managerial class anxiety. I, I have it. I have, I'm, a, I'm anxious about them. Yeah, <laughs> well, but, you know, but then it's kind of like, you know, you could be in a kind of syndicalist position of like, holy shit, the whole society is exploiting the workers, including like the poor people who don't even have a job or exploiting the labor of the workers. Like you could. No, it's plausible. The reason that I say that is because otherwise we'll be blindsided, right? These things crop up, right? There yeah, are these that's, tendencies. That's an, that er, to, from my way of thinking, that's just erroneous thinking. That's just the wrong. It's like asking. It's a you category know, error. It is. Yeah, it's a category error. Right. But it, it, if you think that the problem is the exploitation of labor, you will go there. Yeah. If you, yeah, if you think that. The contradiction yeah. is around uh, arises around the exploitation of labor by labor, okay, or by everybody, right? But right, and but we, workers themselves because it's their labor that's being exploited, right? Then end right. up looking like they're exploited by everybody, which of course they are, right? But, but exploitation is this. You just need to think of that as a technical term. It's not a moral category, you well, know. But in a political movement, how can you keep? From being a moral category. In other words, if 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 people are mobilized to fight against their exploitation politically, so you don't you don't struggle to be to stop to to be treated fairly. You struggle for your fucking freedom. Well, let's you're hope. being restrained. You're being restrained, and you're being suppressed, and you're being corralled, and but you're you being know, mistreated. Right, just rebel against their exploitation. And in other words, this is where you'd need social. But they never really will. Uh, the, oh, if, uh, then the way to correct that will be, don't worry, we'll, we'll give you a raise. We'll, um, the way to correct that ex- feeling of exploitation will be, oh, well, we'll go to war on another nation. And it's worked then, so far. Right? And so then it you'll be paid, great. you'll be paid much better. And for a little while, maybe, Everyone will get a home. And I don't know that the workers ever said that war was good because they'll get 
more. I don't think that that ever worked. No, but that's the solution. The solution is to move it out, uh, you know, to to do uneven development and to get cheap well, capital over could, here. You could, you could try to mobilize the working class against workers' organizations, yes, in a variety right. of different ways. You could. Right. And that's a way to try to address a feeling of victimization around exploitation, which arises basically by saying, hey, I'm not getting a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. It could just be as simple as protectionism. Trade protectionism, like mm -hmm. we should keep jobs in the U.S. and not send them to China, because you know we're starving here or we're opioid addicted here, and look at all the Chinese are working now, and those are our jobs, right? Right, exactly. But, but then that's a spontaneous thing that the working class, the trade union consciousness, you know. Yeah, Lenin talked about, it. and and not only Lenin, by the way. So Lenin gets saddled with a lot. That's like the general framework of the Second International is that the trade union consciousness of the working class has to be superseded by socialist consciousness. And that comes from the bourgeois intellectuals who have this sense of history that the immediacy of struggle will always kind of crowd out, right? It will always be like, well, we need to get this now rather than thinking, where does this fit into the long arc of history and not the 4,000 years long arc of history, but, but for the last 200 years, say, yeah, something like that. Yes, exactly. Or, you know, even just the last few generations, you know, like you yeah. can grasp a trajectory more recently and you could say, look, where does our struggle fit in with how things right. have been going? And, you know, but again, generally the immediacy of struggle, this is why it's not like you need socialist intellectuals, but you need a party, right? You need a party to say, look, there's actually another goal here. It's, it's what the workers here struggling against this now right, right. There's, there's a long-term goal here and that's where the question of freedom comes because otherwise people are like i'm dying here you know right and so freedom is kind of like a, a nice idea right but unless you concretely have a sense of okay i'm part of a project mm -hmm. has goal you know and all of our struggles are towards that goal without that it's easy to say, you know, yeah, I'm a socialist, but in the meantime, you know, my neighbor is kind of shafting me over here. Mm -hmm. Fuck them. I got to survive, you know? If you enjoyed this conversation, please do consider supporting us on Patreon. Our patrons help to make sure that Sublation Media can continue to provide interviews, videos, books, and articles that are critical of the left from the left. If you are tired of remaining stuck within bourgeois ideologies and politics, help us sublate them both.